questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Yes, good evening. Thank you for joining us. It is live. It is a Q&A show, but it's also a time to actually talk to a, uh, I can say, a young lady who's had a, an incredible journey through life, a Holocaust survivor. Thank you very much, Susan Pollock, for being with us on Revelation TV Live. Well, for me, it's an honor to be here, and I'm very grateful to you all. I'm very grateful that I feel relaxed. I feel confident and wanted. I was absolutely enamored, if I may use that word, with the way in which you have such a, a, a sweet spirit, having gone through so much. And I watched the whole program that you did with uh, Simon just this afternoon. And I was so moved um, and I'm so on honored and I'm humbled to have you in our studio tonight. And I'd like, uh, just if you would, to share a little bit of your testimony because it, I know our viewers, if they're anything like me, which I know they are, uh, they will absolutely be um, enthralled if I can say that, in, with due respect for, for what you went through, but, but by the dominion in which you have dealt with this and the love that you have for mankind and have not lost, if, as it were, your faith uh, is incredible. And so please do share just a few for a little while with us. Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me. That's the first thing. Thank you very much for all, giving me that opportunity to talk about my, my uh, history my family and my experiences. It's so very important to look back, need to learn, and we need to make a strong commitment for creating a good future for all of us. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a good position to be in. And um, when I had finally been liberated, I think in my simple way, I've made a commitment that I'm going to talk about it because, because it's so very important for me as well. It's been my therapy uh, all along to share it and to, uh, to warn against any form of racism, anti-Semitism. And... Um, well, it'd be good to start others. with... If I may, Susan, to ask you to start, because I've now listened to your story, it's fresh in my mind, and where you and your family were, how you ended up in Auschwitz. Um, but just give us some of that background, because I know it's important, not only for yourself, but for us to understand what it was like to go through that. Well, uh, I'm a village person, not far from Budapest. And um, um, we lived in this little village, that's where I was born. I liked the simple life. Well, of course, we had no idea what the future would hold for us. We couldn't imagine. I must say, there was always in the background anti-Semitism. But it was controlled. But we didn't take it too seriously. And in any case, where could we have gone? Um, we know that 1938, that Avion conference, for instance, when the threat was known worldwide, what Hitler planned against us. And there might have been, there might have been an opportunity to, uh, to seek refuge somewhere, but it wasn't available in any real, in any real situation, maybe a few, uh, few countries accepted a few. So, all was left to us is pray and hope that the Allied forces will be coming soon and somehow rescue us. But we could not imagine in the wildest of fears what was awaiting us. Well, it was already happening everywhere. But we were living in a sheltered, we had a sheltered life. And of course, the news was managed. Managed in what way? Well, we didn't hear anything about the, uh, the plans, the Wanze conference, for instance, where gentlemen with their PhDs had planned our destruction. We did not know. 
nor did we know that Babiyar took place. So many Jews had been murdered. Nothing. All we could hear was occasionally um, resettlement, resettlement program might be coming for us, but no one explained anything. Are we going to survive as a family? And as hope springs so strong in one's being, everything came back in the affirmative. Yes, we will. And um, we just thought, let the Allied forces be quick to rescue us. But when you were in Hungary, right, how did you end up in Poland, in Auschwitz? Well, this, I mean, there were some demonstrations in the street against the Jews. There were demonstrations about the, according to their thinking, the injustice of having lost territory. Uh, there were demonstrations against other forms of race, of race, although there weren't many, remember, across Europe. It was just the Romans and the Romans and us. They didn't want us. They accused us. There was propaganda against us. There were all kinds of malicious gossip, caricatures and things like that. And um, we kind of welcomed this, this pr proposal that perhaps we could be resettled. But that's all it was, just a plan. But where and how, uh, nothing was specified, really. And so on one day, we had a call up, we had a letter from the local council, attend this meeting where this uh, plan, this um, resettlement program will be discussed. They didn't trust the local council anymore. There were about 16 Jewish families living in this village, Felsherdud, where I was born. But they thought it's better to know and so they went, they attended the meeting, and then shortly after we had a call, come along and, um, and, and um, be, a, be, a, be a member of this meeting. So we did, my mom, my brother and myself, we went along, and I had seen my, my father being brutally beaten up in front of my eyes. They were herded onto a waiting lorry. I hadn't seen him since. He was taken away with all the other men, and we knew where they were taken to, but we were wearing the yellow star by then. Didn't help us. We weren't allowed to use the public transport anymore. So we sent a local lady, local Christian woman with a basket of food to take to him. And she came back with the information that just as well we hadn't seen him because he was unrecognizable. He'd been beaten. Beaten, starved, threatened, dehumanized. And then we were told by the Hungary, Hungarian gendarmerie, I hadn't seen any Germans. Uh, just I'm speaking about the Hungarians. Uh, get ready, start baking your bread, as we normally did. Get some food ready in your, bus, in your uh, backpack from a sheet, because we'll be going on this journey, on this resettlement program. So we did, we were up all night. And um, we had the sheet on our backs. I'm carrying a single sewing machine. Little girl as, well, as I was. How old were you? Hmm? How old were you then? I was not 13 yet. I thought perhaps I might be able to, to help for my family, to sustain my family. I was pretty good on the sewing machine. Children were brought up differently in those days. And um, at first we were taken to a ghetto in, in a nearby town called Vats. And we were eating the food. My mom said, here's a handkerchief holding some broken gold teeth. 
throw it in the loo outside because we were afraid to be found with it mm -hmm. because of the malicious gossip that the Jews had gold orders. So I threw it in. Not long after, a few days later, we were taken to another nearby, uh, by train we went, nearby into camp, internment camp. It was an open, previously used mine. We were sleeping outdoors. It was in 1944, July. And my brother and myself occasionally attached ourselves to um, um, two other cues. This one promised bread distribution. We never got any. That queue offered, yes, if you, if you convert to Christianity, you might be exempted. But of course, it didn't apply to us because it had to go back, I think, not way back. And we didn't want to convert anyway. No. Then we had been told to start marching. Marching to a waiting cattle train. Long march. I'm carrying this heavy single sewing machine on my back. So we marched and marched. Finally, we got to the train. And um, with some straw on the floor, pushed in a lot of women mothers with their children, babies. Men were taken away before, so there wouldn't, just some elderly gen and elderly men, a few of them. The doors were shut. Of course, the windows, there were no windows, just some closures. And then we knew we were trapped. This is not going to be no resettlement. But we had no imagination to think, what else could it be? So a few days later, maybe six, six days, perhaps, we arrived. The doors were open. Ah, fresh air, wonderful. We got somewhere. And then the terror hit us immediately. Many of us died along the way, lack of Water, there were only two buckets, one for water, one for human soil. For 80, 90 people, both spilled all the time. There was no water. As a consequence, many, many children died. And the aggression hit us, shouting, low serine, out. Well, most of us couldn't walk anymore. So we scrambled out, my mom, my brother, myself, and then uh, someone like this, um, forget his name, who was, who, um, who was tried recently, and I attended that trial. Um, he, it might have been him. Get everything out from your pocket. Place it on the ramp. We had nothing. Was this a German commandant? The German, yeah. The one on famous, made famous by um, Schindler's, Schindler's List. Schindler's List, yeah. Yeah. yeah one, of the, um, one of the earlier victims, uh, who had been and spoke Hungarian, uh, whispered to us, don't say you're younger than 15 years old. Why? I didn't know. I just nodded. So when the German Nazi came, the Archbistro, I could speak a bit of German. I said, I'm 15 years old, because I was reasonably tall for that age. And that's what saved them, me. Otherwise you'd have gone Otherwise straight to the I gas. would have gone to the gas chamber. Yeah. Useless. You were only assessed by, the, by your uh, um, height and, 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 and the ability, presumably the ability, to do a short term. So where was your brother and your mother? Next to me. My mum, she was in her 40s, worn, fatigued, and tired, confused. She was gassed on arrival. I didn't know then. Uh, I learned about that 
um, as we were all taken, the survivor, survivor girls were taken to a barrack. One of the girls says, "Where is what happened to your mum?" And I explained, and she says, "Quite, ex quite uh, undramatically, she was gassed. I didn't understand. What does this mean?" didn't question her. My brother was taken um, and used as a Zonder commando. What's that? That's an able-bodied young man, young guy, who um, was made to shovel the bodies out from the gas chamber into the ovens. Right. And how old was your brother? Two years older than myself. Mm -hmm. He was two, he, he was probably 15, maybe not even that yeah. yet. And then what happened next? Well, then they um, made us to dress, lose, uh, throw away the clothes that we wore, shaved our hair, threw some disinfectant on our naked body, and t took us to a um, barrack with other girls, about a thousand girls, 800 girls. And we were on the top level. Uh, there were three, um, three platforms. And um, I was on the top with the girls, um, totally confused. Were you made to work? Not yet. At first, we were regularly inspected. Dropped the clothes, stark naked, marched in front of the uh, Nazi officer. I think it was Dr. Mengele. Oh and he, uh, we knew what was going on, why he was doing it, to see who was losing weight rapidly. But that would be all of you. And if, according to his, Estimate we lost too quickly, useless for slave labor, into the gas chamber. Unbelievable. Such madness, such, such fear. It doesn't make sense, really, because if anybody wants to use your slave labor, you would keep the workforce fed. So it, it just doesn't add up, does it? So there was something else that was going on. The numbers, the six million who were discarded like that, sent to the gas chamber. Because according to them, we had no more uses. So he thought perhaps, well, we knew what was it. We pinched our cheeks. Stood straight. Made yourself look strong. Better. Mm. And quickly tried to pass his gaze. This happened several times. On one occasion, he selected me. I didn't care anymore. I was, uh, within a short time, I was dehumanized. I had no more feelings. You know, no more hope, no more feelings, no more. Uh, no more me. I was just a robot, nothing. He selected me. I didn't care. And that was for slave labor. Uh, I was sent there on train uh, to a big German town. We marched, a few girls, we marched to our work. I was doing some uh, electronic uh, checking. I was shown when these lights, when these two, two apparatus light up, it's okay. I can't remember now, but that's what I was doing. So the food increased more than what I had in Auschwitz because that was nothing. It was just some coffee in the morning, maybe a piece of bread. How did you cope mentally? How did psych the psychological effect that seeing <coughs> your family already uh, lose their lives, um, how did you cope and manage to s survive mentally? 
Uh, at first, while we, while we still had, well, I still had um, the capacity to think, because to think you need food, you need some. Mm -hmm. And we had, we set up a, a, a fantasy game. And this fantasy allowed us to escape the reality, the harsh reality of, of, of the conditions we were in. So from girl to girl, we played it. And what will you have for breakfast this morning? We were starving. So Not you hunger, fantasize. But we remembered our home life. Mm. I'll have a piece of bread, maybe an egg, perhaps some butter on that bread, and we could taste it. Wow. Or, and so it went from girl to girl. It didn't last very long because we were losing weight so rapidly. Mm. So that was helpful. Other than that, there was no thinking. The thinking is dangerous. Your family was orthodox. Yes. So how did you feel, how did you cope? I mean, in the sense of, I was uh, aware that Ellie Weisel, who wrote that book, Night, um, he said, that day my God died. Uh, did you ever have that, those sort of feelings that God had abandoned you? I never did. Hmm. I, I did think about it too much. Deep down, I think, I've, my faith has never been broken. I remember seeing, and I think that seeing has, has been has been uh, sort of been repeated by other survivors. I saw, I looked at the sky and I could see some, or I imagined just a bright, a bright sun spoke to me. And I, I don't know, I, I interpreted, interpreted it, God survives, God never died. And, and that, that, that strength, I think, carried me through. So this was more like a vision that you a had? A vision. Beautiful. Thank God. In the midst of such horror. Yeah. Occasionally I think of it today, to this day. So Susan, what happened then next? You, you along comes um, the end of the war. Along comes the end of the war, I was dying. And death, and death was all around me. Mountain corpses, mountains of corpses. I crawled out because I couldn't stay there anymore. And the British came, the British soldier must have seen a twitch in my body, picked me up. I remember the gentleness Suddenly, what's going on? Suddenly, gentleness. I hadn't confronted that for so long. And he picked me up with such care, put me on that, on that small ambulance and took me to, to, to a, a sort of a clean bed, it was clean beds, and, uh, and, um, and a sort of a hospital-like environment um, where I stayed for a week or two um, and then I was taken to Sweden for recovery where I spent two years and they were very kind and, and helpful to, to me and uh, physical recovery was possible um, still many of us continued to die because they didn't know that food should have been restricted so we got too much and um, at too much. And that, of course, wasn't a good thing. Uh, emotional discovery, mental discovery. Coming to terms with the death of your father, your mother, and your brother? I couldn't, I did not cope with that at the beginning. Uh, I just realized that, the, that it's a different world outside that kindness maybe survived. It was a miracle mm. to 
see that taking place. I remember that in Sweden, when the um, doctor who taught me to walk again, put me on his arm and he said, I've got a daughter like you. Well, I thought it's amazing. His daughter being compared to me, because I lost any forms of self-esteem or, or even, uh, or even uh, a kind of an awareness of myself. And that was my recovery, slowly, slowly. So, coming through all of that, what amazes me, because I heard the rest of your story as well, is that you have not got such an animosity or a hatred towards mankind. And I don't want to mention necessarily uh, individuals, but you have an amazing attitude that's kept you going all these years. Uh, no, hate I don't possess. Mm -hmm. That's obvious. Yeah, hate I don't possess. I realize, um, I realize that, um, well, I don't like to kind of put myself in a, in a category to say that, um, that I am totally without, without some, some form of, of caution mm -hmm. against human beings behaving in a in an unacceptable way so how do you feel today having uh, come through 70 years or more uh, and seeing what's happening in the world today with the rise of anti-semitism again uh, how do, do you feel that perhaps there's a time uh, that in the jews the jewish people need to seek perhaps uh, not just asylum, but actually to make Alia? Yes. Um, I, uh, I did want to go to Israel uh, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was physically stronger, but um, not strong enough in 19, that was in 19, um, when did I, 1945. 47, 46, um, but... Um, you went to Canada, is that right? From there I went to Canada, yes. Yes, a Sharia came out from Israel and um, took in some, some strong guys. Um, I mean, it, it needed a lot of work in those days. With the kibbutz and everything, that the was kibbutz, hard work. And yeah. of course, the malaria was still ripe in, in Israel. And uh, you had to uh, you had to do physical heavy work. I wasn't capable of doing it. I would have gone. Um, so they sent me to Canada, and there I met my husband to be, and I got married when I was 18 years old. And that was the start of building a new life. And since then, well, there was a long period when I had worked. And, um, you know, in partnership with my husband. And later on, I gained education because I lost education completely. In Hungary, I only had um, primary school education. And um, later on, I got a degree. I used to go to evening classes. Um, and we had uh, children together, of course. And then I became a Samaritan. Very good. When I feel very low, and it happens often, I say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. Who will ascend the mountain of righteousness? Only those with clean hands and a pure heart. I cling to that. It's mm. a great scripture. How many of us have a pure heart, let alone clean hands. Uh, Simon, um, we do the emails as well yeah. that are coming in live at revelationtv.com and also the SMS number, which is on your screen. Please do, uh, have you got any questions uh, for Susan whilst we're here on a live show, please do that tonight. We got a few in already. Uh, I'll read down this one from John, who writes, uh, hi folks, what a lovely lady Susan is. So glad to, that you had her on the program 
Uh, she's opened my eyes and she will be in my prayers. So that's really nice, John. Thank you. And uh, this one is from Jeff. And uh, Jeff's a man of the moan heart. He says, hi, Howard, Simon. Uh, how fantastic to have Susan on the show tonight. I'm so moved by her story. I want her to know that our horror and disgust of what happened to the Jewish people knows no bounds. Mm. God has put a great love in my heart for the Jews and I love them with a great compassion. I will always stand up for the Jews and for Israel. As a Christian, I repent of the shame of that wicked treatment and uh, what a brave lady Susan is. Uh, we owe her so much and love her so much. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and Howard and Simon for your stand for God's chosen people. I'm just an ordinary man, but I know I speak for many, and that's from Jeff. Um, absolutely fantastic email, that one. I have one more, and, and this one, Tony, I want to know why in particular you're asking this question, but I'll read it anyway. So good evening, all three of you. A quick search on Susan led me to an article uh, where you said on Hard Talk, I can't forgive. Is this true, Susan? Can't you forgive? I think you have to ask yourself, Tony, if you had been through what Susan had been through, uh, how would you have responded? Um, and it's so easy to say, yes, we would forgive our enemies, yeah. but, but the magnitude, the horrors, and you can only forgive those. Yes, we do as Christians have to forgive our enemies and it is part of a healing process. Yes. But, but to go what you went through uh, and mm -hmm. to face the horrors that you went through, uh, which is hell, personified. Um, yeah, how do you respond to Tony's... Uh, well, I feel similarly. I'm lucky I survived. I've lost more than 50 members of my family, most of them children. Who am I to forgive? Is that if I were to confront or rather speak to the person and says, I'm sorry, I, I, I've done this or that afterwards, and then he genuinely, or she genuinely, shows that she's a deserving person for forgiveness. Forgiveness has to come from within. Not just an easy word, I forgive. But you have to contemplate, what, what have you done? Mm. Because we human beings can easily be persuaded. Mm -hmm. When I was liberated, I thought, anti-Semitism would disappear forever. It hasn't. I was wrong. Is there not a difference? Because we all have to come to terms at some stage in our life with different situ situations. It could be family, friends, foe, whatever, false accusations, um, where forgiveness is something that um, is, is not so easily uh, carried out because we're human. There is, uh, we know that scriptures say that we're to forgive uh, because our God forgives us. But as Susan says, it's usually when we say, sorry, we made a mistake. Um, and also living out as a human, there are moments that trigger when you think, you know, I can't forgive that. But yet, what I've observed about you, Susan, in the little bit that I've a time that I've seen you and met you and also watched the program that you did last year with Simon is the fact that you haven't let, you haven't become embittered with it. You know, the, uh, hatred you, hasn't got to No, it, 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 there's such a love and a, and a sweet spirit about you. If they could, they'd probably see a little bit more of the human uh, frailty and also how can one deal with and be reminded of those situations, of those times when you lost your mum, your dad, yes. and your friends, your brother. Absolutely. And you were treated in such an abominable way. I don't think I would personally would ever forgive. But you've got to forgive, but don't you can't forget. So can I can I make a distinction? Mm. I think there's this distinction here between um, um, <clears throat> not allowing hatred to take root in your heart, and you mm. haven't done that, Susan. And, and that's what's so remarkable about you. But there is also a, a righteous anger in you, and rightly so. Mm. Um, to think that, you know, 50 members of your family were murdered for no reason other than the fact that you were Jewish. Mm. Um, you went through what you went through only because, uh, because you're Jewish and because of this hatred um, in the hearts of the Nazis. Uh, and we also know that this is dark. We know that this is demonic. Um, and, and this is inspired by actually Satan himself that inspires. And, and that's what makes anti-Semitism so irrational. Because mm -hmm. when you meet and spend time with people like you, Susan. You are loving, uh, you are kind, you are generous, and you are warm-hearted. And, and this is the experience that I experience with Jewish people 
and Israelis. And on the face of it, here's a, a, a people that have given the world so much um, in terms of scientific technology, medicine, medicine. help. I mean, uh, I mean, who else helps their enemies? I mean, for example, if we take Israel, for example, um, Israel uh, recently sent sent in their uh, risk risk their elite soldiers, commando division, to fly into Syria to get. Um, um, a family member of a Syrian girl that they brought into Israel who who needed an a, operation. needed a kidney replacement or mm. something like that, and, and the only person that they could get was a relative, and they literally sent in a special operation deep into war-torn Syria, flew that relative all the way back to Israel so that girl could live. Now, what other nation does that? No other nation does it apart from Israel, um, and this is why also we've got to remember also when it comes to this one, what the Jewish people have given us. You have given us a whole foundation for our entire civilization, and that's our Judeo-Christian heritage, mm. the Ten Commandments. You've given us the Bible. You've given us the prophets. You've given us a moral code. You, the Jewish people, are a light unto the nations. Mm -hmm. um, and a blessing And as a well. blessing, an incredible blessing uh, in terms of scripture. So, you know, that's why anti-Semitism is not rational. Jew hatred is not rational. It doesn't make sense. Um, there's no way that, that you can excuse it. But we know that once man allows hatred to come into his heart, we know that uh, this is when we're living in, in dangerous times. And that's something about the Jewish people always wanting to help. Victim. Let's uh, have a look and see if there's some more emails and texts that uh, be... Uh, I've only got another, another one from, from Tony, and Tony writes, thanks for your uh, story, Susan. Um, yes, Simon, I know. Uh, yes, it's hard, I know. Uh, regarding for forgiveness, I'm just quoting from Matthew 6, verse 15. But if, if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. I'm only saying, as uh, Jesus did, nothing else. God bless. Uh, I just want to help to save your soul, Susan. And yes, it's easy for me sitting on the sofa, but still. That's from mm -hmm. Tony. Um, June also writes uh, this email, says, Hi, folks. Uh, forgiveness. Susan. Um, isn't eaten up by hatred. Uh, she has come to terms with what's happened to her. I'm rather cross that that viewer mentioned this. It sounded so self-righteous. I hope the viewer has managed to uh, get the beam out of his eye. And that's from Jay Simpson in uh, Dunfermline. Oh, I think we should move you. on from that one. But um, can I ask you, Susan, because when we're showing Howard's excellent visit, uh, uh, video when he was at Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, I just ask you, had you been back there, and you said that you had been back there with your grandson yes. in um, 2015 to mark the 70th anniversary yes. of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, can you describe for us what it was like going back there for a second time? It was very difficult. It was... I, I did have to suppress anger within me. And, uh, and, and mostly the incomprehension, what human beings are capable of doing to each other for no apparent reason. However, we must remember that anti-Semitism hasn't started with Hitler. No, long before. Long before. And that hatred and that those malicious accusations actually had gradually built up a kind of uh, 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 an intuitive response to Jews over the centuries. And, and I think that is what we need to together eliminate that do not be judgmental. In some cases, speak about that accusation if it is factual, but not when it comes from this inherited, long inherited kind of image, the Jew. As I do ask the students when I go to schools to teach, I said, I, I've opened up my heart to you. What I said, that's the truth. Hmm. Now, tell me, what image do you get in your mind when I say the word Jew? Mm -hmm. In all truthfulness, the students here 
that I've spoken to, and over 30 years, many thousands, they don't say, oh, the Jews are violent, or the Jews are... They say, oh, they're very helpful to each other. They're hardworking. Um, depends. If they never met someone like a you know, more modern person, they say, oh, well, they're separatist. Um, but I haven't, I haven't come across personally who would say, oh, you know, the Jews like Shylock. Mm -hmm. In the literature, mm -hmm. we get the nasty. Ooh, you yeah, know, I is. want my money. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, on the whole, we're moving in the right direction. I'm hopeful. I hope I'm not mistaken. So when I come across, um, yeah, some politicians talking in riddles. I think one of the things, if I may say, Susan, is that um, particularly in my lifetime, I've seen the anti-Semitism come up, and sadly amongst Christians as well, in as well as secular uh, society, is that they look at and blame the Jews for putting Christ to death. And I'm being absolutely yes. on the line here, okay? Now, when I, in my 30s, I was reading scripture and I came across some important scriptures, not only in the Old Testament, which is what I read first, and I went on to read in the New Testament. I studied it every single day for two and a quarter years till I'd gone through the entire book and so I could understand it and comprehend mm. it. And I came to a conclusion that um, the Jews, according to Romans 11, was such an important revelation to me that we as Christians needed to take good note of it, that God had not rejected his people, Absolutely. and that we were being grafted in to the olive tree, which is the Jewishness of us, and that we were to um, not think highly of ourselves, and, and more humbling was that, was that there was a warning in that scripture about our haughtiness yep. and that we would be held to account if we, uh, in fact, we, the scripture says we would be lopped off like a branch that needed to be cut off from the tree if we were to think that we'd replace the Jews, okay? Now, this, I believe, has led to a lot of anti-Semitism. And so what I did um, when I was in my early 30s, I went to Israel and I drove to Israel, and um, because I'd spoken to my church about this scripture in the New Testament, not the old, yeah. and they told me to go away. <laughs> and I, I produced a little video as to why uh, I go on about Israel all the time, and I just, I'm gonna have got a short version of it, and uh, just, can we play that? Because it, it leads to when Netanyahu, what he said in response to my questions, which I am very nervous on television or even in, in conversation generally, uh, that he more or less interviewed me, but what he said was so profound, and I believe that's what led to Revelation TV being founded. And this, have a look at this, Susan. I was astonished when I first read Romans chapter 11, and I tried to share this same revelation with my church at that time, who basically told me to get lost. So I did. This led to me making arrangements to drive to Israel on my own in a little VW van, where I worked on a kibbutz, Kafar Blum, in the Upper Galilee. This was to be, and still is, one of the highlights of my life. Well, having come from the UK where I had a very nice lifestyle, thank you very much, but that was all vanity, as Solomon said. And for living on the kibbutz was such a simple and uncluttered lifestyle, just a bed in a room and food for the day. Getting up at the crack of dawn to start a day's work, picking apples or cotton. I recall being paid around $4 a month, I think it was, for my labour. Wow. You don't do this for the money, but out of love and commitment 
to Israel. I spent a total of three months in Israel, travelling from the north, Kiryat Shmona, to Ras Mohammed in the Sinai Desert, and trying to meet as many Jewish people along the way as I possibly could. The day I left Israel in October 1979 was one of the saddest days of my life. As I drove my little van into Haifa port to start my journey home to London via Athens, I wept. I did not want to leave. Since that time in 1979, I've been to Israel numerous times, probably as many as 20 times. I can recall clearly when God gave me the privilege of starting Revelation TV, and it was one day during a live TV show that I said on air, who wants to come to Israel with me? Immediately, inquiries started to come into the office. And it was Tim Vince who began to organize everything for our first tour group to Israel. For I was far too busy trying to keep the wheels of Revelation TV turning and I was oblivious to how the numbers were growing of those coming with us. Imagine this. When I turned up at the airport, I saw so many smiling faces and I thought there must be someone famous behind me. So I looked behind me and I saw no one. And then I realized to my amazement that they were all looking at me. There were 720 dear folk all lining up to get on three planes. My, what a thrill that was, despite it being at the time of the Second Intifada, for we all were still trusting that Israel was the safest place to be. And now, over the 15 years which Revelation TV has been broadcasting, thousands of our dear viewers have also been to Israel for they too have also come to a more enlightened, historical and biblical understanding of Israel and the Jewish people, which includes their right to live in their God-given land. Now looking back at the time when I had no one to share my revelations with, I've been so blessed and privileged to have been given the opportunity to broadcast these vital truths to so many people. So I hope this answers the reasons why I go on about Israel all the time and why the re-establishing of the state of Israel just had to come to pass. Look what God did for me and for you. He educated us. He enlightened us. So let us continue in this battle for truth as Benjamin Netanyahu once said to me. I just wanted to say that we acknowledge and deeply regret the of what Christians have done over the last 2,000 years. And, um, but even in light of that, would you comment on the role that Christians are playing today in a positive way? Well, I think, I think what's happening here is a, a very positive thing. Okay. I think the work that uh, Willem has been doing and all of you are doing in supporting the state of Israel, the uh, rebirth of the Jewish people in their land is uh, the most positive uh, uh, declamation of faith in our common heritage that uh, Christians and Jews can do together. So um, I think it's very important. In order to continue um, in this positive role, which I'm, I'm very uh, eager to see and participate in myself personally, um, what would you say to encourage us um, to look to the future and perhaps in a way that we can continue to help? Is there a new way perhaps? Well, I think it's spreading the truth about Israel as opposed to the many falsehoods that are leveled against it. You know? uh, you know, the, you spoke about the evils of the last 2,000 years. Those evils were made possible because of defamation, because of vilification, because of, uh, because of the lies that were spread about the Jewish people. And always, uh, uh, physical brutality was preceded by, uh, by a web of lies. Uh, I think that working the other way, building a bastion of truth about Israel and the Jewish people and the Jewish state, is the greatest corrective of that. And uh, fortunately today, we have a Jewish state, and we have uh, many Jewish and many non-Jewish friends that can fight the battle of truth, which I believe is the most important battle for uh, the future of the state of Israel. Thank you very much. I agree with you entirely with that. <laughs> well, what Netanyahu said to me some 20 years ago, establish the truth about Israel and combat the web of lies has emboldened me to do just that alongside my small Gideon's army team and 
by the grace and favour of God, may Revelation TV continue to do just that. Thank you for letting me share this precious story. God bless. Susan, that's really what Netanyahu said, gave me the impetus, if you like, to start this channel um, and Wonderful. to bring truth rather than the lies or the web of lies, which Netanyahu said uh, comes first, then comes the horrific uh, follow through of um, action against uh, Jewish people. And, 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 and the knowledge for me that we're together <laughs> and we're, we're sharing this, the past, the difficulties, but we're building a good future for all of us and, and spending the truth. And I'm eternally grateful. I'm, thank you very much. Well, we're all in this together, really, and yes. we all want the truth. And no, yes. no matter how hard it is for us to swallow sometimes, um, and the truth can hurt, but we, we need to get there. Simon, uh, some more emails and texts? Yeah, yeah absolutely, ideas? absolutely. This one's uh, from Maggie, and uh, Maggie writes, uh, Good evening, folks. Um, I've always seen myself as a patriotic uh, English woman, very proud of our role in the Second World War. But on the other night, I watched a film on Rev TV about how we betrayed the Jewish people. People. After the war, uh, we put every obstacle in the way of the Jews returning to their homeland. Mm -hmm. I could hardly believe uh, what the Atli government did by trying to please the Arabs um, who had oil. It was a very unsavory part of our history, which we must face up to and tell people about. And that's from Maggie. But also, Maggie, I think we have to make, mention the government of... Um, of, uh, what was it, uh, Chamberlain, um, who produced the white and green papers in the 1930s that stopped mass immigration of Jewish people into the British Mandate of Palestine. Mm. And it's believed that estimated around 1 million to about 1.5 million Jewish people across Europe could have been safe from the horrors of the Holocaust had the British government allowed these Jewish people to go and enter into the ancient homeland without those restrictions. Um, Kevin writes, uh, hi, I just want to say to Susan, um, for coming, to thank Susan for coming on Revelation TV and uh, telling all about what happened. Uh, I'm a born again Christian and the Lord has put a love in my heart for Israel and the Jews. I found your courage to tell the truth um, of what you went, it was amazing, I think I just missed the last bit of that one. This one says, uh, thank you again for showing us how the Jewish people were treated. Uh, the film Forgotten Promise was amazing uh, as well, and how Britta treat, treated some of the people. Don't believe it ever happened. I told Leslie that film should be shown on main, t uh, main TV. Bless Susan and thank you. And that's from Kathleen. Um, I'll just read out this one. This one says, I'm not certain, I think it was Cory Ten Boone after the war, a German soldier recognised her and asked her for forgiveness and she said, I can't but God will, and that's mm. Kathleen again. That's uh, and I think it's important to yeah. remember that um, Corrie ten Boone was a Dutch woman um, who was a part of the Dutch resistance. She was a mm. uh, Christian. She actually helped uh, rescue Jewish people and save Jewish people to the extent she was taken to a concentration camp herself, mm. and then miraculously she she was she was released, and um, she came face to face with a German officer that was in charge of the camp and uh, she, she forgave him and he became a Christian and he repented uh, and said sorry for what he did to her and to the rest of the Jewish people. Um, this one says, uh, blessings brothers and sisters Susan. Uh, we are so blessed to hear, I could only repeat what has already been said. The love in, in um, my name when I feel, I think, how the world treated you today. Honestly, mm -hmm. it uh, brings me to tears. My love to you, sister, and all of Israel. Uh, from you and my story, my heart goes out to you, sister. I don't want to rattle on, um, but the heart for the Jewish people is a gift from the Lord. Um, 
and that's from Ivor in uh, Scotland. It's very difficult when some of the words are missing. You're trying to read them up. Glad you're reading because uh, yeah, I'm yeah. dyslexic and I, I get I'm dyslexic worse. as well. So uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not yeah. doing very well. But yeah. how would, I want to pick up something that um, that you said theologically um, that. Sadly, so much of the ancient hatred um, that comes stems from Christianity is blamed on the fact that the so-called Jews killed Jesus. Jesus said in the scriptures, I give up my life freely. That's right. He went to the cross mm -hmm. to die for our mm -hmm. sins. He did it willingly. Mm -hmm. Because if he hadn't have done that, our sins wouldn't be forgiven yeah. and we couldn't have that relationship with God. So it wasn't the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. that murdered Jesus. He did it himself. He was that ultimate sacrifice. Yes. That lamb sacrifice mentioned in the Passover lamb uh, for our sins and for the atonement of our sins. He also said something very important, I think, uh, that both uh, a Jew and Christian is that he said, I came for the lost sheep of Israel. Susan, if you know my wife, Katie, uh, we've just been doing a study on Ezekiel. And what is so amazing about the end of Ezekiel is the fact that we see the millennial reign of the kingdom reign, when the Messiah is reigning in Jerusalem, there is a restoration of the 12 tribes and all the mm. nations of the world come to Israel to worship the God of Israel. Um, mm. that's, that's how the final chapter of world history ends. Um, right. And isn't that incredible? I like the one in Isaiah as well, which talks about uh, Arabs as well, coming to recognize that uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and they come up to the mountain of God. Uh, uh, at, the, at the end days. So that's quite a feat too. Definitely. Uh, this one says, um, what an amazing program. Thanks for sharing such a wonderful experience. Thank you, brothers. And uh, this is uh, from Brian. He says, um, thanks to God for you, Susan, and bless you for your calmly delivered testimony. Unfortunately, man's heart will prevail. Um, unfortunately, man's Hatred will prevail uh, until our Saviour, uh, uh, Jewish Saviour, uh, Jesus Yeshua HaMashiach returns. It is a marvel to see you looking so well at your age, considering all that you've been through. Yes. God's angel Gabriel must surely be watching over you. And as you say, there is hope of a good future for all believers. And that's blessings and shalom, Brian. I think that's sums it up very well. Wonderful. It's not just self, the big me, 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 but the recognition that we're living under the guidance of our God. Mm. One last email or text? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got uh, time. You, love by view, you love by viewers. So this is a very quick one. This one says, thank you, Howard and Simon, for a fantastic uh, TV channel. You are blessed because you bring God's truth. Uh, please tell Susan that she is a truly amazing, lovely lady. Yes, and you. we love the Jewish people and uh, say that we would be nothing without them. God bless you and keep getting the word out. Thank you so much. And that's love from Sarah. And um, this one's very well. It says, thank you, Susan, for coming on this program on Revelation TV. TV. Please don't ever get discouraged in the face of anti-Semitism. Uh, God is working out his purposes. The Bible predicts the increase of anti-Semitism and the further suffering of, for Israel and the Jews. But when your Messiah returns, he certainly will. And probably sooner than we think, your suffering will be turned to joy. Keep on sharing your story. Mm. Thank you very much. One minute left. So and if there's another one there that you want to read or is something particular Yes, Susan, we're going to give you the last word. That's well, all. this experience has really enriched my life. I think it strengthened it that we're not our own own. It's a big, it's a big task, what, what you're trying to achieve and what you're successful in. And, and for us to know that we're together and, and you're helping and, and please God, go a long way. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. God bless you as well. And to your viewers, or our viewers, take care and never let the side down. Israel will be forever.